Now that we've established a good introduction as to what gene regulation is and what a LAC operon is in terms of its discovery and what it contains, we're going to continue our discussion at looking at the operon specifically and entitle this next flowchart simply operon. So the LAC operon is a type of operon. An operon, we're going to start off with a bit of a background information, um, can be defined as the following underneath this background part of the flowchart. An operon is simply going to be considered a genetic structure. So if you think of a genetic structure, you have to automatically think that this is going to be a structure with DNA, DNA-based structure and nucleotide-based structure. But specifically, this genetic structure is found only, absolutely only in prokaryotes. We as eukaryotes do not possess any operons and that distinction will make a lot more sense when we get to eukaryotic gene regulation. Right now whenever you think of operon you have to understand that an operon is a part of the regulatory gene regulation process of a prokaryote like a bacteria like E. coli. More specifically we can define an operon as the following. Its two main components include structural genes, okay, structural genes, because it is a genetic structure, so of course it will have genes, but structural genes that will have a related function. So we'll say with related function. I think this will make a lot more sense when we look at the example of a structural gene with its related function when we talk about the LAC operon in just a few moments. In addition to the structural genes present, there are also regions of the operon known as controlling DNA sequences, okay? Controlling DNA, and we'll just write S-E-Q-S for sequences. There are going to be two main controlling DNA sequences in an operon that we're going to be looking at, and that operon is going to be, and we'll write over here, E-X for example, LAC operon. That's going to be our main focus for prokaryotic gene regulation. So the LAC operon has two controlling DNA sequences that I'm going to define right now. One of them is known as the promoter region. So we'll say promoter. So this is a region of this genetic structure that is known as a promoter. So think of a big, let's say, chromosome that we're looking at right here, okay, and we're going to have certain regions this is going to be my operon. This is a bunch of genes, but one part of this operon will be a promoter. So I'm just going to write P for promoter. At this region, we're going to have the following. The promoter region of this chromosome, think of it as a chromosome, will be uh, a nucleotide sequence. So, you know, A, T, C, and G. A nucleotide sequence, and it's also going to be a place, comma, at which RNA polymerase, so RNA polymerase, P-O-L, um, will bind. So binds here, let's say. And now a key word here is binds, okay? What I mean by this is that RNA polymerase, specifically at the promoter region, only, absolutely only binds here. Well, you might be asking, well, what else can it do? Think of what a polymerase, specifically RNA polymerase, does in terms of gene expression. It's supposed to actually technically transcribe, right, and transcribe genes, but the RNA polymerase that sort of latches on at the promoter region doesn't transcribe the promoter sequence. So we're going to write that down as doesn't TXN promoter P-O-R-M-S-E-Q sequence. All it does, it sees the promoter and it seriously just goes and binds there. It does not transcribe the genes associated here, okay? It's basically a flashing light that this chromosome has that says, hey, come over here, RNA polymerase. I have some structural genes that I need you to transcribe. We're going to get to those. Think of the promoter as literally a promoter. It just tells RNA polymerase, come over here, latch onto here. I have something that needs to be transcribed. Right next to the promoter, most often, is another DNA controlling sequence. So remember how I said there was one and then there's another one, um, two. So we'll say one and two. Number one is the promoter and number two would be considered something known as the operator region. Okay, it's called the operator region. Usually right next to it, so we'll write this as O. And this operator region will serve as, again, since we're talking about DNA, 
This is another nucleotide sequence, so it has A, T's, and C's, and G's, a nucleotide sequence near the promoter, let's say, near promoter, okay? But what does it do? What, it's, it's, what, is, it, uh, what is its purpose? It's a controlling DNA sequence, just like the promoter is a controlling DNA sequence. Its control relies on the fact that the operator is often considered our on slash off switch. Okay, switch of sorts in quotes. Remember how I said gene regulation is all about turning on some genes at some times in some cells? Well, you need a switch that tells you, hey, turn on or turn off. The operator region will provide and serve as that switch. But again, let's remember that this is just a switch. Thus, you have to understand that RNA polymerase will only bind here. It only binds here. What does it not do? If this just serves as a switch, is RNA polymerase going to transcribe the switch region? No, it doesn't need to. What it needs to transcribe is what we'll talk about next. So RNA polymerase only binds here, and we want to make sure we write this down, doesn't TXN transcribe. So these one and two, both of these controlling DNA sequences known as the promoter and the operator are not transcribed. So make sure you understand that one and two, these P and O regions are not transcribed. Well, what is transcribed then? What are we regulating? We are regulating um, at the LAC operon three structural genes, okay? And we're going to go over each of them. There are three structural genes that we're regulating. Again, I said structural genes is a part of the operon with related function. Let's look at what that means, related function. When we say structural genes, we simply mean genes that have protein coding sequences, okay? Genes that have protein coding, SCQS for sequences. Did one and two have protein coding sequences? No, all they served, at, served as were basically switches and sort of lights that say, RNA polymerase, I want you to come here and bind. And so let's draw an RNA polymerase molecule like this. This is our um, RP for RNA polymerase. It just binds here. It doesn't transcribe anything, doesn't code anything, thus no proteins will be made out of the PNO sequence. It's just basically a place in which RNA polymerase will bump into and say, oh, let me just stay on here depending on the in environment. So what are the protein coding sequences? What are the three structural genes? Well, one of them is known as lactose permease. So this is one of the protein sequences that will eventually be made here. This is going to be its job, its related function, let's say, will be to transport and bring in lactose. So it transport, it's a transport protein that's made. It goes to the membrane, this transmembrane protein, and it also brings lactose into the cell. So we'll say brings... LAC, lactose, into cell. Okay, that's LAC. Let me make that a little clearer. LAC. Brings lactose into cell. Lactose permease. Another trend, uh, structural gene is known as beta-galactosidase. So it's a B like this. It stands for beta-galactosidase. So notice that all of these are ending in ACE, thus they're enzymes, thus they're proteins, thus they have a function. Beta-galactosidase, which I'll just be calling B-gal from now, is just something that's going to be important in hydrolyzing lactose. So if we remember all the way back to our biological molecules lecture, what does hydrolyzing mean? What does it mean to hydrolyze something? Well, this hydrolyzes lactose into, that means it breaks down, right, into its structural components of the glucose molecule and a galactose molecule, glue and gal. Galactose is going to be, or lactose specifically, consists of glucose and galactose in order to break that down, because remember, we're metabolizing lactose, we're going to hydrolyze it utilizing this enzyme. And lastly, the last one that you just need to remember is something called galactosidase, galacto Cydase transacetylase, very fancy name, but um, I don't think you need to absolutely know its function, just understand that this is also another enzyme. So, back to our operon, our LAC operon here, you can just write this down as one, two, and three. There are three genes, three coding sequences for lactose permease, beta galactosidase, and galactosidase transacetylase right next to our promoter and operator sequences. These are our structural genes one, two, and three. One, two, 
3. So what does this mean in terms of gene regulation? What do we get at when we establish a lac operon structure? Well, what we need to understand is that all genes in this structural region, all genes are actually right next to each other, next to each other um, on chromosome, just like I drew above, right? Just like I drew here. One, two, and three are right next to each other. This is very, very purposeful because this allows all of these genes to share a single promoter and operator, P plus L. They share a single promoter and operator region. Notice how P and O are going to dictate whether or not 1, 2, and 3 are transcribed by RNA polymerase because they are the sort of on and off switches of our operon. Okay, We're regulating whether or not 1, 2, and 3 will be transcribed. RNA polymerase is here, wants to know if it can go ahead and go down this sequence and start transcribing 1, 2, and 3 these three enzymes. So they share a single promoter and operator region. Thus, we can state that based off of this, all information, all coding sequences from all three genes, okay, from all three genes that we just talked about, all three coding sequences um, are transcribed, TXNED, into one single, so one single RNA strand. This is basically the idea that we have an all or nothing transcription process that's going to occur here. And this all or nothing process is all dependent on situation. And what I mean by this is that let's imagine we have um, the following situations. I'm sort of just going to box this out over here. This whole idea that we're talking about, gene regulation, is situational. It depends on the environment. So let's imagine these two situations. Situation one, imagine that I'm growing E. coli with no lactose in its environment. So you're growing E. coli with no lactose. Okay. So this E. coli is growing on a petri dish and you don't have any lactose on the petri dish. What do you expect the transcription levels of all three of these enzymes to be? High or low, will this operon be transcribing lactose metabolism genes if there is no lactose? Of course not. We expect all three enzyme levels to be low. Okay, All three enzyme levels are low. But now the one that's of interest, the most situation of interest to specifically Jacob and Minot was the following. What if you grow... E. coli, because remember this is only in prokaryotes, these operons, so what if you grow a operon in the E. coli that's with a increased amount of lactose in its environment? Then you're going to obviously see that all three enzymes um, will be used, they will be synthesized. All three enzymes synthesize in order to, and I know I'm squeezing this in, metabolize M-E-T-L-A-C, metabolize lactose. So overall, we have this operon situation. It's a genetic structure with these structural genes and controlling regions known as the promoter and operator. These structural genes, 1, 2, and 3, will only be transcribed depending on the situation and the environment. This is regulation in a nutshell. We're going to share a single promoter and operator region, and if we share a single promoter and operator region, that means once we get the go-ahead, all info from all three genes will be transcribed in an all-or-nothing process so long as the situation says so.